Luke chapter 1, verse 46. And I've been dancing through the book of Luke, and I've been finding just j- different gems in this book. And I wanted to talk to you about this scripture here. Luke 1, 46, and I'm going to read down to 55. And this is Mary, the mother of Jesus, and she's this young teenage girl. You might not know that about Mary. She was a very young teenager when, when she became pregnant with Jesus. And it says, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant for behold from now on all generations will call me blessed for he who is mighty has done great things for me come on somebody and holy is his name and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation if you want mercy fear the Lord He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. For he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Come on, let's pray. Father, we thank you. Your word's already blessed, but we ask you to give us spiritual ears to hear the very thing you want us to hear today that you would give our hearts just the tilling it needs to be the proper soil this morning so that we can be able to hear your word and be blessed come on in jesus name the church says we are like full swing into the holiday season and something broke my heart this morning i was driving and i saw a postal a postal service uh truck and I feel so bad that Amazon got these postal people on Sundays that used to be a, a day off for them and they're working and nonstop. What are you receiving at your houses besides bills? Amen, right? It's packages. And ever since like, especially it seems to like has grown crazily ever since COVID, but, but packages have come nonstop. Now we know that this season is a season that we remember that God has began to birth the plan of salvation through Jesus, right? But in this time of year, many of our homes are being littered with endless Amazon packages and Target pickups. Thank God for Target pickups. It's just like, it's just perfect because from, from all the men should have said amen because there's a curse over, over Target and Marshall's. And it's, you could buy, probably not get out of there without spending $100. And so the fact that they have pickup, you can just pick exactly what you need. And your wife, I hope she's not watching, does not have to walk through the whole store and pick up extra stuff that we probably don't need. Thank God for Target pickups in Jesus' name. But this is the season of endless packages. And in today's world, you probably know this, that when something is shipped, you get a confirmation of that shipping. A text message an email or you get a tracking number where you can see exactly where the package is at how good is that you order something from california oh it's now in arizona (laughs) took a fight from and you're watching it it's now taking a fight from arizona and it lands over in 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 hartford and now it goes to the, the shipping center distribution of ups over in stratford and now it's coming to my house And you're all excited as you are tracking this package. Now, when it gets on the truck, you get a confirmation. Your package is out for delivery. All the anticipation just begins to build up in your heart. And you know exactly what you ordered, but you apparently love the experience of opening the box. And companies know this. Companies like Apple know that it's an experience to open a box, which is why they spend so much money on packaging. Some of these boxes seem to have been sealed by the CIA, though. Secret service. It's just all these layers of security on these things. But nonetheless, when it arrives at your home, the text that you got a confirmation text that you got a package comes to your phone. Or if you have a ring doorbell, it's right there. You know you're getting confirmation of delivery. And you get confirmation out of a lot of things. Confirmation of when your bills are due. You have an upcoming traveler's insurance bill. Just me. Right? You know, your, your payment of this bill is due in one week. And they just give you all this confirmation. You get confirmations for everything. You get confirmation for when a purchase hits your account. You get confirmation for when somebody sent you money on Zelle or Venmo or Cash App. You get confirmations for all the things. When you need support from a website or want to complain, you get a confirmation email back that they received your complaint, but they don't care that much, and they're going to wait 24 hours to contact you back. <laughs> somebody say Confirmation. Wouldn't it be great if God operated like that? The moment he made you a promise, he gave you a tracking number. 
He gave you shipment information and a confirmation text message to let you know, hey, Phil, it's going to be there in exactly three days. But God doesn't work like that. God works more in the realm of faith, more in the realm and the currency of heaven, which is, is, is you believing and trusting him apart from what you can see with your own eyes. Heck, it would be great that when God gave me a promise, he sent me a tracking number to the APS, the Angelic Postal Service. He let me know exactly when Gabriel or whoever one of his homies are coming to bring the promise that he gave me. But sometimes we wait so long in faith, but all we want is one confirmation. And so when you get a confirmation from God, it's a really big deal when God confirms something in your life. And I want to talk to you today about what the result of confirmation from God should be from your life and what it should evoke from you. And, and I want to look at this, and it's a simple a sermon titled, Mary the Magnifier. Mary is the mother of Jesus, and in this text that we just read, there's a lot of things that are happening, just so much going on, and I want to touch on it real quick, that one day, much like last guy we talked about last week, Zechariah, she gets this encounter with the angel Gabriel, and he just pops up, and at this time, she's probably anywhere from 13 to 15 years old, maybe. Yeah, Mary is young. And the angel's like, hey, by the way, it's nice to see you, you know, you have found favor with the Lord. And we're all like, we like that part. You know, the grace of God is on your life. And he says to her, hey, by the way, you're going to have a son. And this son is going to be the son of God. You're going to be with child. And she's like, how can this be? I'm, you know, I'm, this, this 13, 14 year old girl is betrothed to be married to a man. She's not even married yet. She's still a virgin, right? And she is told that this baby that she's about to have will sit on David's throne and his kingdom will have no end. Now, listen, guys, we read this from the vantage point of the Bible and the vantage point of our current day. And we kind of take things for granted as we read it because we know the end of the story. But that's a really bad way to read the Bible. You might not know this, right? You should always read the Bible from what is called an inductive approach to reading the Bible. Inductive reading means that you read the Bible as if you have never read the story before so that you can glean new things from it. Because what we often do is we take something that somebody taught us or some preacher has said and we read that into the text because we heard them read it into the text, but it might not actually be there. And so you should always inductively read the scripture and just ask yourself the questions and investigate the scripture and say, what is going on in this time? And and why why should I even keep on reading this story? And here's one of the things that I look at. How did Mary feel being maybe 13 to 15 years old, being told, hey, by the way, you're going to get pregnant without having sex with a man? Now, I don't know about y'all. Ladies. If I took a poll here, none of you would be happy about that. Like, what? You, you're going to do what to me? Mary probably is thinking that she's imagining this. She probably thinks that she's hallucinating. She probably thinks that, that this is all a figment of her imagination. There's no way you can't tell me little old Mary ain't all jacked up in the mind here. We know what she says, be it so unto me as thou hast said. We know she responds that, but have you ever given a response you didn't fully mean in the moment? Oh, yeah, I can be there. Oh, God. Why did I tell Gary I was coming? I'm so tired today. I don't want to go. Some of y'all had that today, amen. (laughs) But you're like, oh, I don't even know if I want to do that. Sometimes we give a response that we don't automatically really think about. Now, the angel told her something, though. He closed it off with this. He gave her a clue. He says, hey, and by the way, your old relative Elizabeth in her old age is also pregnant. Here's how I know that Mary doesn't fully know if she's encountered God. Here's how I know. Verse 39 of of, of Luke chapter 1, it says that Mary with haste went to see Elizabeth. In other words, she's looking for a confirmation. And she's like, well, the angel, the the dream I had, or the whatever it was, whatever encounter. Have you ever had an encounter with God that was so ridiculous you didn't know if it was God? God told you something so big and wild that you're saying to yourself, like, this this cannot be God. I am imagining this. That's kind of, I think, where Mary is at. As I read the text, she runs with haste, emergency, urgency. She runs to Liz's house. She's like, hey, Liz. And she's like, oh, my God. Like, would you see her stomach? This woman is six months pregnant. She's pregnant, pregnant now. And she instantly says to herself, I am not bugging. 
I'm not crazy. The moment Mary's voice even echoes in the house, the Bible says that John the Baptist is baptized in the spirit, in the womb. He begins to leap and even Elizabeth herself is filled with the Holy Spirit, right? And that's Mary's confirmation right there. And Elizabeth, she declares a song and she, the first thing she does is she begins to sing this song. But now, Mary knows, son, now that Elizabeth is pregnant, Mary knows that she's carrying the Son of God. Mary now knows that she's not tripping out, she's not bugging, she's got her confirmation. But now what happens after you've gotten a confirmation? And maybe you got a confirmation, but you haven't done anything with the confirmation. What do you do with the confirmation? Well, Mary decides to sing. She decides to begin to magnify God. And what I love about Mary's song, right, it's known as the Magnificat in in Latin and Greek. It's known as this great song where Mary, she magnifies God. A couple things to know. God is the subject of Mary's song. Mary was not singing about herself. She was not praising herself. She was not thinking about things which she might accomplish. She was saying, my soul doth magnify the Lord. God is the subject of her song. Mary was probably tired. You got to understand, she just walked this whole journey. She takes this whole journey, miles, maybe a few days, and she's going to Elizabeth's house. And the moment she walks in the door, all this begins to take place where the Holy Spirit falls on Elizabeth. The Holy Spirit falls on the baby in the womb. Babies are jumping all over the place, kicking, squirming. All this craziness has happened. And now in the midst of that very moment where she's tired, she begins to sing a song and get creative and begin to praise God. And she says, my soul doth magnify. Because when you get a confirmation, you should have a moment of praise in your life. When God begins to confirm something, you can't just be like, "Mm, okay, I'm going to seal this in my heart and ponder on these things. No, no, no. You should be praising the Lord. Mary forgot about her tiredness, for her faith was being confirmed. Listen, that's the word all by itself, that when faith is confirmed, tiredness is overlooked. You know what I'm talking about. The moment you get closer to the sun and you realize you are as close as you thought you were, you don't care how tired you are. You keep on going because you're there. You can't forget about, about God in those moments of being tired when you get a confirmation. She now knew the angel who came to her wasn't a figment of her imagination. It wasn't a false vision. It wasn't an illusion. It wasn't some self-aggrandizing dream. It was the Lord. He was real. And the message was clear that she would give birth to a son as a virgin and that she would carry the son of God. Here's point number one, that confirmation should lead to magnification. She magnified God the moment she got her confirmation. And this is a part where I think as believers, we don't always do the best job with. And to magnify something in in a context of a magnifying glass means to take a small thing and make it bigger. But in this context, it means to take a big thing of God and zoom in on a certain area and say, for this, I'll praise you. For this, I'll worship you. For this, I will give you the praise. Because we all get excited when we get confirmation of a package. Oh, shoot, my oils came in, and we're rushing home to get the oil. We know it's there. Oh, shoot, my sneakers came in. You know exactly what is on the porch, but you're rushing to get it. Man, she magnified God. She rejoiced in God. She rejoiced in his assurances. God assures and confirms our faith. We're all on this journey of faith and in his loving goodness at various intervals in our life, God does this thing where he confirms us and he sets us on fire with the confirmation maybe of something he told us a long time ago and he reminds you that he he is in control and that he loves you and he is with you. You should be magnifying God about every confirmation or blessing in your life. Every single small one or great one. I had a moment the other day where it might not be something for you to magnify God for. Oh, but I began to praise the Lord. So about 12, 13 years ago, I went to Puerto Rico with Pastor Carmen. And we went to Puerto Rico. We were at Old San Juan. And I remember going into this little, just little, just uh, cafe. And this old man says, what do you want? I said, I don't know. What are you going to give me? He says, why don't you try a Mallorca? And I'm like, okay. What's a Mallorca? He's like, it's like a pastry. Just trust me. You want to try it. And so I went, and he gave me a little cup of coffee, cafe con leche. He gave me mallorca with a little powdered sugar on top, and it was cut in half, warmed up with butter. And I bit into it, and it was like the manna from heaven. 
It was as if angels were singing in the back while they made this thing. I lost my mind. I bought some home. I mean, I lost my mind, lost my mind. So every time I go to Puerto Rico, I'm looking for Mallorcas. I don't care where I go. Do you have Mallorca? So I literally, I just, if I had to explain what it was to you, if a donut and a croissant had a baby, it's a Mallorca. That's the best way I can explain it. So I'm at Starbucks, and, and last week was a somber week, right? We were doing a lot of stuff for the family, uh, tying up my father-in-law's affairs, and, and we were rushing one morning to get to the family's house, and so we went to Starbucks, and I ordered an almond. I went to for what I knew. I ordered my, my, my brown shake and espresso, don't judge me, and then I ordered an almond croissant, just real basic stuff. I didn't even look at the menu. Didn't even look at the menu. I get into my car because I'm rushing and I'm driving away, and I open it up, and there's like cheese all inside of it. I'm like, what is this mess? And it's like, I look inside of the ham and cheese sandwich. I'm like, I did not order a ham and cheese sandwich. I ordered a croissant. What is wrong with these Puerto Ricans? I knew I should have said it slower. I don't speak any Spanish like that. I just point. Like. And I, I opened it up and I, I pulled the sandwich out. And I, I went from complaining to praising God. Carmen, it was a ham and cheese Ana Mallorca. I said, Puerto, Puerto Rico Starbucks have Mallorca? What? I lost my mind. I'm in the car like, God loves me. I didn't even look at the menu, but he gave me what I wanted. Look at God. I was praising God. My wife is looking at me like, you are ridiculous, Lewis. I'm texting my friend who makes my look at my like, You don't understand what happened to me today. God loves me. Confirmation. I'm going to praise him. And I'm sitting there, this biggest smile on my face. I'm just letting the music just, Jesus lost me! If I can praise him over something small, how much more over the big things he confirms? If I can thank God for a mistake that ended up being a major blessing in my belly, how much more can I thank God for the other areas of my life? I, I, listen, man, you got to learn how to magnify God in the small areas. God confirmed to me that day something simple. I know what you want more than you want. Even when you don't read the menu, Lewis, I got you. Now somebody else probably got my almond croissant. And that's okay. They have to learn patience. <laughs> but God, I, when he confirms something, I want to praise him for it. God's confirmation should lead to our magnification of him. Mary immediately about, upon getting confirmation of God's Word to her, she begins to magnify God. And look how she opens it up. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humblest state of his servant. For behold, now all generations will call me blessed. She says, my soul, my inner man, it magnifies God. My inner man, the deepest parts of who I am, rejoice in him. Mary has had no false illusions of herself. She knew she needed God as much as the next person. She says, God, my Savior. She understands at that young age, I need a Savior. He looked on the humble estate of his servant. She understands how undeserving and lowly she is. She doesn't say, look at me. I'm first among all women. God has done this for me. Look at me. She goes, no, no, no. She goes, God, my Savior. God, my Deliverer. My soul magnifies you. My heart, my spirit rejoices. I don't know about you, but we we can use some more praise and magnifying God. Some of y'all really know how to worship, but praise is your weak spot. And I'm telling you right now, God says, hey, you can magnify me. You can praise me when I confirm some things. Some of us church folk are too dignified to even sing out loud in church or shout out to God or lift your hand. And and I'm going to tell you, maybe you should get undignified and begin to magnify the Lord and begin to praise God for what he has done and his work in your life. If he has done something for you, maybe you should learn how to praise him for it. Now, Mary receives her confirmation. Right? And her response is to magnify God. This is so telling to the type of person that Mary is because her response is to shift all the focus and all the attention on God. And why is this important? And especially in this generation, why is this important? Because many of us in this generation are enthralled with the gift and not the giver of the gift. We're enthralled with the gift. The entire subject of the song of Mary is God. But the subject of many of your lives are self. 
In the first portion, she's praising God for recognizing her lowly estate. She speaks about the mighty God, the merciful God. And then the next portion, she zooms far out into the history of Israel and begins to talk about the past faithfulness of God, how good he always has been, how good he always will be. And this is the proof that she can magnify this God. She praises God for how he remembers Israel for previous generations. And she sings of the history of the faithfulness of God. And the only thing she says about herself is she's of humble estate and all people will call her blessed moving forward. That's all she says about herself. Magnifying God means that God is the center of the magnification. Here's point number two. You might not like it. That's okay. Maturity magnifies the giver. Immaturity magnifies the gift. Maturity magnifies the giver. Immaturity magnifies the gift. Lewis Burgos knows that Lewis Burgos has done nothing to grow citywide church, but by God's grace. Amen. Talking about a guy never went to college for church stuff, never went to seminary, never went to Bible school, just studied hard, loved on God, and leaned on the Holy Spirit, and God did the rest. Every time the worship team gets up, I'm like, Lord, thank you for this team that you have assembled because I know that I have done nothing. You have put this together. You have done this in your mercy. It's so important that in, as we grow as a believer that we realize more and more we are not the subject of our lives. That God is the main character even of our story. That Jesus is the main character in your story. That God is the one who deserves all the glory. I love getting my kids gifts. My favorite part is not them playing with it or them unwrapping it. It's their gratefulness for the gift. It's them saying, Daddy, you're the best. I can get my kids something cheap and silly. Oh, my God, this is the greatest day of my life. <laughs> and they always say that no matter what I get them. It's probably their auto response. I took them horseback riding once and Ari was like, oh, all my dreams are being fulfilled right now. <laughs> I'm like, weird. Who says that? A couple months later, she's unwrapping birthday gifts. She's like, oh, more dreams just coming true. My dad is the greatest. I'm like, you keep on saying that. I'm going to get you more gifts. Christmas comes. I throw them all at her. She's like, this is the greatest day of my life. I'm surrounded by gifts. Oh, my God, dad. Simultaneously, if you upset her for anything, this is the worst day ever. I'm like, really? Well, I'm going to join Nick in this the worst day. Go to bed. And she's like, why? And it's just like, but I love giving them gifts because they magnify their dad. Because they realize that it wasn't their strength that got it for them. I tell them, hey, you weren't the greatest today, but I'm going to buy you something from five below. Not because, not because you're worth it, but because you're worthy, because you're my daughter. Not because you behaved enough for it, because I want to bless you today. Because you're my baby, I'm going to get you Chick-fil-A today, because daddy wants it too, but <laughs> mostly for you. Right? But we like, we, we, we like when our kids bring the magnification to us, how much more should we magnify God? We have to see this. Maturity says this. It says that God is the one who has done it. Immaturity says, look what I can do. Maturity says, God has given this to me. Immaturity says, look what I'm doing up in these streets. Maturity says, all over social media, it says, God is great. Immaturity has to put your face in front of everything you're doing, and you take glory from it. What is God doing? Because you, you can be like, hard work pays off, but yeah, yeah, but who gave you the strength to work? Who gave you the grace? Who gave you the wisdom? Who gave you all the planning? Who gave you all the opportunity? Well, I worked really hard. Yeah, but who, who gave you breath in your lungs? If you want to go down to the basics of it, who gave a spark to your spirit? Like, who, who allowed you to be born healthy? It was the Lord God. Right? That doesn't magnify God when we always put ourselves first. So often when God does something for us, we spend more time reveling in the gift that we have been given. What if instead of reveling in the gift before others, we reveal God to others? What if instead of saying, oh my God, look at this house that God gave me, rather than saying, hey Gary, I know that I have no business having this. But if it was not for the mercy of God and for the favor of God in this transaction, I got to tell you this testimony. And I'm telling you, God can do something in your life. Small or great. We should not just revel in what we have, right? We should reveal God to others through what we have. Whether it's a natural talent he gave you or it's a gift he's bestowed upon you, how can you point that back to God and not do it in a false humility way? Because here's the thing, God destroys prideful people. Pride is the most dangerous sin because God, the Bible says clearly, God opposes the prideful. He, he, he will literally destroy the prideful. And here's why, because pride is the first sin. The first, all sin was birthed from pride. 
The sin of Satan was pride. And the Bible says clearly that God opposes the pride. I don't want to be, I don't want to sit here and have God opposing me. Many of the breakthroughs you might be waiting for might be the issue of pride in your life where God is opposing you. Why won't this door? I praised, I prayed, I fasted. And God's like, because you're arrogant. The moment I open this door for you, you're going to think you done did it. And if I open this door for you, you will think it's you. So how about you humble yourself? How about you humble yourself? Many an immature believer would take this and think to themselves how great they are and how God has done it for them and other people need to get on their level. But Mary points to God and says, I'm not worthy. She declared all of his good deeds and all of his works and calls him mighty. You see, immaturity makes self the subject of our song. And all of you are singing the song, whether you can sing or not. Your, your life is echoing a rhythm in heaven. And is that rhythm or is that melody speaking to the fact that you are God's servant or that you are so great? Mary magnifies God. She points it back at God. Listen, I'm more convinced now than ever that everything in this church is all God and not Lewis. How do I know this? Because I'm leaving next year for a long time and I'm totally fine with it. Why? Because I know it's God's church, not mine's. I was telling my pastor friends just last night, hey guys, I'm not stressing at anything. Why? Because it's Jesus' church, not Lewis's. I know he has control. Immaturity makes you the subject. Immaturity points at you. Immaturity talks bad about others who aren't doing what you're doing because you think you're so great. But maturity says, man, I want to point all the glory back to God. And I don't have to make a request from people every time I do it because I know that God himself will provide all of my needs as long as I magnify him. Every time I know it's God. You cannot be the subject of your own song and think that you're giving God glory. It's got to be God. Mary, as young as she was, this is amazing to me, she's a teenager, but she's got the maturity and the mental wherewithal to be like, you know what? This is because of the Lord. This is because of God. Immaturity takes the glory, but maturity tells God as the center of your story. It makes God the middle and says, God, you did this. When God gives you confirmation, you don't get more puffed up. You say, whoa, God, I'm more humble than ever. God, I thank you. I know that I'm not even deserving, but man, and that's not to be self-deprecating. That's not to beat yourself down and talk bad about yourself. I'm the worst of the worst. I'm just bad. I'm, uh, I'm ugly. I'm this, I'm that. No, no, it's just say, like, don't get filled with, with, with yourself. Don't be prideful and arrogant. Be humble and say, if it wasn't for God, I couldn't do this. Be weary of pride and prideful people because pride has a way of being, a just, it's, it's contagious. Be wary of who you're hanging out with who are filled with pride because it will get on you. I don't know about you. Have you ever been around somebody who's so self-aggrandizing that it, it kind of turns you off? It's like, I don't even want to be here because you, you feel it in your spirit because at the, at the center of everything we know is God's goodness, God's faithfulness. All of my gifts, all of my talents, God shaped them. Amen? Amen. So there is Mary. As I close with this thought, here is Mary, this pregnant virgin, ready to face all this type of ridicule and embarrassment for being pregnant and not married. And Joseph, he might even leave her, but we know he does it because God visits Joseph too, right? But Mary, as she's going, and she knows what she's about to endure, yo, Mary begins to sing. Like, what are you going to do about this, Mary? She's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to go write a song. <laughs> just going to go, what are you going to do with a song, right? And just, just know that God's going to move in my songwriting. I'm like, What? And there was Mary, this obscure young girl, who, this is before anybody even knows who she is. And her personal confession says, God's my savior. It reveals that she understands who she truly is and that she needs God. You need that understanding in your life. Never lose the, the understanding that you desperately need God every single day of your life. She saw that she was unknown to man, but she saw that she was known by God. She was poor seemingly insignificant of little purpose in life and to this one encounter where God in all of his goodness and faithfulness he lifts her out of obscurity and puts her into the center story of history man isn't it just like God to be able to raise up the lowly to raise up those who are of no consequence to other people he elevates us he lifts the humble and lowly. If you want to be elevated by God, be humble and remain lowly. Yet the higher God lifts us, here's the dichotomy here. The higher God lifts us, the more humble you should be. 
The higher God lifts you, the more you should praise him. The higher God lifts you, the more you should focus back on him. And many of us are waiting on God to confirm things or to bless us in a specific way that you have asked. And I want to tell you, posture your heart in humility, like Mary. And you're going to see an acceleration when there's humility. Where there is humility, you will see an acceleration. And here's what Mary does. And here's point number three, real simple. That the higher the elevation, the deeper the declaration. The higher he lifts her, the deeper she praises him. The higher he takes her, my God, my soul magnifies you. She begins to praise him even more. And I want to challenge you that humility in your life needs to be a habit. It's not a state of mind. It's a habit in your life that we remain humble no matter where God takes us. Citywide church, no matter where God takes us as a church, whether it's up or down, no matter where he takes us, we remain humble. Whether we end up with the biggest building on the planet or nothing at all, we remain humble. Whether we end up with 10,000 people or 1,000 people, we remain humble. Whether God begins to break a revival out of here that echoes through the nations, we remain humble. Because the higher the elevation, the lower the declaration, and the deeper we have to go and say, God, I know it's only you because nothing that we have done is deserving of this great work in your life. And I know it's only you. That the more he blesses, the more we must learn to praise him. You see, Mary was understanding this. And over and over, we see that she begins to praise God. And God opposes pride. He lifts up humble people. She remains humble. Man, we must learn to have a life of praising God for the works that he has done. That word magnify in the Greek, it means to declare the greatness of. The idea is that it's a habitual lifestyle. That she was constantly praising God, that her soul would forever praise God, that her spirit would forever praise God, that it would be a lifestyle. And when God is magnified, we zoom in on his goodness, we zoom in on his faithfulness, and we say, look right there what God has done. Man, in any case, the higher he takes us, the deeper we go in declaring how worthy he is of our praise. The greater the elevation, the deeper the declaration, and God has to be exalted in us. The moment you begin to exalt yourself, you begin to fall into error. Does God's work in your life lead to him being magnified in your life? Does God's work in your life lead to you magnifying him, or do you think that you've earned it? I want to challenge you that God is worth praising. And maybe the first way that you praise God today is to magnify him for the gift of salvation. That what, that's what Christmas is all about, is the unfolding and the unraveling of this master plan of God to bring men to, 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 to salvation. And in that, you can praise God. Maybe the way you magnify God today is by offering God all of your life. But many of you are here, and you're believers, and you know God, and you're watching online, and you know God. You know him. And the more God does in your life, maybe somewhere along the way, the enemy has tried to put a little bit of pride in your life. I want to remind every single person, I don't care what you have accomplished in your life, God is the center of it all. I don't care how high you get in your life. I don't care how big your salary is. I don't care how deep your pockets are. I don't care how much money you got. I want you to know that God has given you everything. I don't care how little you got. I don't care how many opportunities you don't have. What you don't have, God hasn't given to you yet. But in it all, God is worth being magnified. Is there anybody in this room who knows that they have something to give God praise for? Well, then you should just do it. You should praise God right now. You should take 30 seconds and just begin to praise God. You don't need, yeah, you don't need a special moment. You could just, yo, I got something to praise God about. He's been faithful in my life. He's done saved my soul. He's done blessed me all throughout this year. And maybe I've endured some battles, but I don't look like what I've been through so I can praise God. He's worthy of it. He's so worthy of it. How are you magnifying God in this season? How are you lifting up God in this season? Come on, take 30 seconds. Think about your year and say, God, thank you. God, thank you for giving me health in my body. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for sustaining me. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Yeah, come on, just thank him online. Thank him in the comments. Come on, thank him. Thank him. Testify to yourself. Testify to yourself right now. Testify to your spirit and say, oh, my soul does magnify the Lord. Oh, my heart does magnify God. God, my Savior. 
He's looked on my servant of humble stature and he's lifted me up. I should have been dead right now, but by his mercy, but by his grace. I could have, I could have went down with COVID, but by his mercy, but by his grace. I wish I had about a hundred people who just knew, who just knew, who just knew that God has sustained them, that God has done something, that God is the author of your story. I could have been bound by addiction, but I'm not. It's by his mercy. And so I magnify him. I take it and I just zoom in. Oh, look at this. I zoom in. Look at this. See, don't be distracted by the whole picture. Zoom in. Zoom in. Zoom in and say, God, 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 I, I could magnify you. I shouldn't be this happy, but I am. I shouldn't be this blessed, but I am. I shouldn't be this filled with joy, but I am. I shouldn't have anything that I have, but by his mercy, he thought it not robbery to pour out on your life. Can I encourage you this week to magnify God? Can I encourage you to magnify God all over your social media? Can I encourage you to magnify God on your job and with your friends? Can I encourage you to magnify God in your little friend group chats and everything else? Can I encourage you to be a magnifier of God and not a minimizer of God this season? Can I encourage you to look throughout this year and not just look at it as being the worst year of your life, but say, God, you are worthy in spite of. You're worthy in spite of. Come on, he's faithful. He's good. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Let's bow our heads real quick. Oh, Jesus, you're so good. You're so faithful. We don't deserve it, but you're faithful. Jesus. Forgive us for every negative word we've spoken over this span of our lives. Forgive us maybe even for looking at you with eyes of frustration, God, because we haven't got what we wanted, all the while missing what we can magnify. Lord, help me not to miss anything else to magnify you about. Help me not to miss one more opportunity to lift up your name. Help me not to miss one more opportunity throughout the rest of this year leading into next year to magnify the Lord to rejoice in my Savior, to go after you with all of my heart. God, I want to be in position to magnify you, to magnify you. Lord, if there be pride in our hearts, deal with it. Deal with it severely, God. Deal with it, God. Remove it. Bring us to repentance, God. So that we can become the magnifiers of Jesus Christ. That we don't detract from you, that we add to you, God. Lord, let our friends get sick of hearing about how good you are. Let us change our conversation to magnifying you and not minimizing you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for those in this room who need to make a commitment to you. Lord, who are on the fence with their salvation. Lord, I pray right now that they would offer their hearts and lives to you. That they would give themselves over and that their soul would magnify you today. Come on, we give you all the honor and all the praise. Come on, the church says amen. amen. And amen. We love you guys. Hey, listen, if you're new here and you've made a recent commitment to Jesus Christ, there'll be some people in the front here ready to take some information from you. We'd love to connect with you, and we want to be able to help you in this walk with Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. you Got to get up on out of here. We got another service coming in.